It's 5.25. We'll begin in another five minutes.
All right then. Hello everybody. We have close to 50 people. Maybe the remaining are on their way. Let's get the day started. Welcome to another session of MAG2. And here we are once again and uh, let's get started. Just give me another minute to let these people in. There are still a few slightly late coming latecomers. So let's let me just let them in. Just give me a minute and then we'll get started. Well then, hello everybody. Good evening and uh, let's get started. Good evening, sir. In between, it just seems I got kicked out. It says there is some issue with my network connection. I hope it's all right and it's sorted right now. Maybe there is some issue in terms of my network stability. So apologize for the same, just in case I get kicked out of the room, please be patient. I shall join back within a few minutes. It's just some technical issues. All right, I hope I'm audible. Let's get started. And uh, yesterday, if you remember, we had, uh, uh, been dealing with T.S. Eliot's murder in the cathedral. And uh, as we all know, we were not able to co get it completed yesterday. We had one point to be discussed and uh, I had promised you that today we'll begin with that and then move on to John Osborne's look back in anger. All right, so let's get started with that today. Let's continue from where we left. 
yesterday. So one point that we were yet to discuss was Murder in the Cathedral as a worse drama. So we did discuss in fragments uh, the vision of Eliot as a poet and how he tried to bring poetry to drama, how he was inspired by every man as opposed to Shakespearean blank verse and uh, his mission in terms of his religious affiliations. And uh, we also tried to figure out the role of chorus, the Greek similarities and so on yesterday. So just continuing from where we left yesterday, uh, the prime justification for using verse in drama is that it will achieve more than prose. In 1936, Eliot claimed that verse drama gave a more complete experience than the abstraction of prose, implying that the dialogue of the latter communicated only at a simple level. The playwright should not think of poetry as something added according to him. Verse enabled him to orchestrate the drama like a piece of music. Action and plot, we all know, does captivate audiences, but they should also be moved by a pattern underlying plot where deeper, non-articulated levels of feeling may be tapped. So verse forms, rhythms, language, and imagery intensify dramatic situation, dialogue, and motivation. And uh, obviously, in uh, Murder in the Cathedral, he could not use, as I told you yesterday, the language of the 12th century, either Anglo-Saxon or Norman French. He was particular that the language had to be lively enough to concentrate the attention of a modern audience and yet convincing enough to take them back to a distant historical event. Since he wanted to draw a contemporary moral from the material, the last effect he wanted was an archaic distancing. So he felt he had to avoid the Shakespearean echo and uh, he uh, based his work on the molds of every man. And he had tried that slightly before in his previous plays. And uh, the most prominent meter in his play is a four stress line building up through similar parallel units of contrasting or balanced phrasing bound together by alliteration. This effect is a development of one employed by Eliot in his earlier poems like The Wasteland, for instance. And the colloquial and poetic are interwoven to create tension between spiritual awareness and everyday realities by Eliot. And mind you, spiritual awareness is something that he himself has underwent. And the changes of rhythm in the work prepares the readers or listeners for each new kind of response or variation in emotion. For instance, the first tempter's lightly tripping abstractions contrast with the heavier kind found in Beckett's anticipatory, for a little time, the hungry hawk speech. Or couplets with double rhyme produces emphasis, derision, and aggression. A different kind of emphasis comes from the third tempter's removal of the definite article from a summary of the political situation, giving it the air of an irrefutable proposition, which is quite spurious. The tetrameters are forceful and inconsistent throughout the play. And uh, these poetic attributes adds to the effect of the play in general. Apart from this, the long lines precede shorter ones, as in the opening contrast between the broad poetic moments of the chorus questioning of their unease and the agitated repetitions of the priests. The play is enriched by the development of echoes and repetitions which bind and advance interpretative meaning in a challenging way. The most significant an extended example of the technique is found in the fourth tempter's parody, uh, 
of Beckett's centrally important first speech. In contrast to the tempter's mockery of his confident abstractions, the chorus used longer lines descriptive of an everyday reality given sorry <coughs> given a nightmare quality. The intellectual challenge of the tempter is intensified by the sensuous vividness of the alarm of the women by the simple direct language and flatness of tone. A thoughtful formality is immediately matched by images from daily life. Yet, even the key profoundities of you know and do not know passage become a refrain that catches the ear because of and in spite of the intricate phrasing. The various exciting modes of verse are interesting in themselves, but they are also significantly appropriate to speaker and subject matter. Eliot makes verse and imagery serve his dramatic purpose. The simple doggerel of the knights in unison presents their, un in their united intention and uh, their lack of separate personalities. Like the old wise, a farcical attendant upon the devil in the medieval morality plays, the vulgar knights at times are presented humorously in the exaggerated terms of comic variety theatre. At other times, they assume the spurious born homie of the hustings or political rally. The colloquial apology deliberately breaks the surface of the play, and this seems to have posed problems for some critics. The apology acts in the fashion of Brechtian alienation, shocking for a purpose to distance the audience from their emotional response to the preceding action. Rhyming tetrameters are used to pose Beckett's retorts to the tempter's taunts and couplets abound. Beckett responds to the agonized chorus with the resolute propositions rhymed neatly in couplets. Now is my way clear, now is the meaning plain. Temptation shall not come in this kind again. The last temptation is the greatest reason to do the right deed for the wrong reason, which happens in Act 1. So the verse of the chorus is most varied, reflecting its many purposes. Free flowing lines of different lengths build atmospheric description. A more insistent rhythm emphasizes the nature of daily rounds. Beneath the familiar, there is unease. The longest lines reflect panic, the repetition of powerful verbs adding to the terror. Passages of powerful emotion are counterpointed with liturgy, the tedium, as I told you the other day, and the, uh, you know, the, the techniques that he brings in. And they accompany the professional opening of part two. In such a variety of effects lay part of Eliot's hope that verse would achieve more than prose. He showed to <coughs> sorry. Yeah. So he also displayed that he could differentiate character in verse. The tempters, for instance, use a kind of clipped economy of expression, which gives their lines a common challenging tone. And yet they are also established as individuals. The first tempter is characterized by flights of lyrical poetry. The second tempter's emphatic tone derives from an insistently rhythmic verse full of alliteration. The third tempter favored man-to-man -man approach, which is helped by colloquial intonations. And the fourth parodies by Beckett's own voice and language. So we can see that uh, even in verse, he is different. He's distinguished it in uh, various ways. And uh, we can see that Eliot is at his most Shakespearean in various points. In most of the passages, we can see that he is suitably realistic, as in the description of merchant and laborer. Homely realistic rapidly but smoothly gravitates to the elevated questioning of fear and doubt. 
when the tempters combine in their own chorus towards the end of part one, the short lines of abstractions lead to lists of endeavor and effort which are mocked as meaningless. Questions give simple happenings a threatening effect in a, in a single long line describing rain and wind in Act 1, line 626, just in case you want to go back to that. And long lines also elevate humble actions in the final affirmation. Prose is used to bring the play back to our world, down to earth in the apology and the sermon, both of them adopting public form of address, defensive and threatening in the former, intimate and interpretative in the latter. A sermon is exactly right in terms of the play setting and hero and also corresponds useful, usefully to the dramatic device of the soliloquy. The prose gives audiences ears a pause from the insistent and powerful rhythms of the verse and offers explanations, one true and one false, of the central event. Apart from this, we must also note that the description of the play as verse drama is too simple. In the nights, we have the melodrama of the murder, a music hall turn in the comic aspects of their apology and the Shavian farce in the shock assumption of modern attitudes. As a religious experience, it offers the liturgy of the Te Deum in Troits and versicles. In the focus on Beckett, we have a biblical presentation on the scale of the Book of the Job, a mystery play in the story of a saint, a derivative from Milton's Samson Agonistus, with a central figure beset by tempters and a modern morality play reminiscent of every man, featuring a central protagonist confronted by a sequence of allegorical personages. We had discussed about the chorus yesterday. So the chorus are not only a reminder of Greek drama. There are so many critics who have pointed to the Essiclean nature of the play, a primitive tragedy concentrating on a single event and a single hero, both observed from different angles of vision, while tension and suspense steadily increase. We must also note that the influence of his other plays can also be seen in the formation of chorus and uh, the techniques used, especially plays like The Rock. And uh, there are certain critics who say that the play lacks certain roots. We cannot completely agree with that either. For Eliot, safeguarding a living theater meant tapping established traditions. So the strands interwoven, interwoven into the play's texture range over the centuries, and few of them presented the kind of life associated with naturalism. Eliot's play is not a drama of human relationship, although there is real terror in the reaction of chorus and priests to what happens in the climactic part. In parts, it is a symbolic play of ideas in its portrayal of man's struggle with sin and temptation, and its plot has careful organization and balance of, say, a Ben Johnsonian kind of a play. In that sense, it's a theatrical tour de force. So these are certain basic fundamentals that I wanted to add to what we discussed yesterday regarding the versical nature of the play. And uh, due to the shortage of time, I would also like to share a couple of links with you at this particular point of time. And uh, yeah, I'd like to share an article with you almost 13 pages long, just in case you want to go back and have a look at some additional reading material. This might be of some help to you. I've shared the link in the chat box. You may go back to and uh, have a look at that later. Another reference that I would like to share with you, just give me a second is, as I promised to you yesterday, the BBC version of Murder in the Cathedral. That is when the play Murder in the Cathedral was aired on BBC. 
the link is again from YouTube. You may go back to and have a patient listening as and when you get time. Even though not as detailed as mine is, Professor Dr. V. Hariharan from uh, University of Kerala, Trivandrum, uh, who's also currently the head of University of Kerala, Trivandrum, uh, attempts to uh, summarize the play for you in EPG Part Shala. It's barely 27 minutes long. So I'm sharing that link with you as well, just in case you want to go back to and have a listen to a condensed lecture on the murder in the cathedral. All right. So leaving murder in the cathedral behind, let's begin our new journey in the path of John Osborne's looking back in anger and uh, before we get started with the play i had asked you yesterday to go back and have a look at what the angry young men movement was all about because in case you have short notes for your question i mean in your question paper angry young men is uh, one such short note that you would preferably have even if you don't have that for a short note, even for your essay question, they may ask you uh, what is meant by the angry young man movement or how far has the play look back in anger justified the essence of the angry young man movement. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. So let's get started with the angry young man terminology. Before that, there are still people coming in. Let me just get let them in. All right. So uh, a basic understanding of the angry young men movement would help you understand the play a little bit more better. So various British novelists and playwright. Oh my God, still so many people coming. I would suggest, I know we are in the fag end of our sessions and we have barely two or three more sessions, but ideally I would say that irrespective of whatever commitments you have back home, acknowledging that you are distant learners, it would be ideal that you join not late than 10 or 15 minutes. Today it's fine because I'm just gonna start look back in anger at this particular point of time. But otherwise, it doesn't make any sense when you drop in midway, an hour or a an hour and a half late, into the class. And uh, when this bell keeps clinging, tung, 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 it's such a really irritating distraction for me. Already, the problem with online class is that you don't get to see people. And uh, looking at a black screen, you're trying to be as animated and enthusiastic as possible, and somehow trying to get the basics across. And then when people come late by, say, 20, 25 minutes, it's a really irritating thing. And just because I don't say that doesn't mean you can keep repeating that every now and then. So please make sure that you, you come to my class not more than, say, 10 to 15 minutes late. Because initial 10 minutes, we may still discuss a few things related to what we discussed the other day or maybe some general instincts. But say 10, 15 minutes later, I don't think that's a respectable thing to do. If, apart from what I think of you, it is, it is a lack of self-respect uh, that you are putting on display yourself. So please, please don't do that to anybody for that sake. It's not about me. Okay. So, uh, yeah, once again, before we move on to uh, angry young men, there's one thing I've been uh, thinking of assigning you over the last two days. I keep forgetting. So today we have look back at anger. Tomorrow we are waiting for Godo. And I had told you that the day after, which is our last class, I'll be dealing with the techniques of how to write annotations as well as essay questions. And uh, we'll also have plenty of time for your Q&A, if any, discussing various patterns. So in that process, uh, it would be good if you can try your hands at some soliloquies, at least a couple of them, or at least one of them. So, uh, no, that's okay, Akshay. I understand. I was not being critical about any of you. The only problem is, you know, having been in my class like that of Hamlet, you would know the sort of teacher that I am by now. So I am not someone who likes to be at the confines of some restricted liminal spaces. 
So already both students and teachers struggle because of this online mode. It has a lot of limitations. And uh, when you when you study theater, it, it is really a shameful act for me to sit on a chair and simply go on lecturing. Yesterday, while I was, while I was trying to uh, give you an overview of Murder in the Cathedral, speaking to you about the interlude and all, when I look back, I really felt sad. Because otherwise, I would be st standing on the podium and I would be somewhat pretending like Beckett and I'd be trying to utter certain words. I'd be enacting those parts. So when I look back, I feel so demotivated when I uh, look back to those offline days. So amidst that, when these tung 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 keeps happening in the class, that to say, I'm not speaking about you guys today. Yesterday, one, one and a half hours later, I had three to four to five people coming on a regular basis. So that's really upsetting. It's not that I don't want to be angry angry with you, but then it's it's really irritating. Think about yourselves in my shoes. You're trying to communicate something despite lacking that fire, despite the medium being not friendly to the art that you're trying to impart, and despite that you're trying to be ignited and be passionate about what you're doing. And you have these hindrances, distractions. See, another one pops on my screen. I'm not joking. So, so that's it. Yeah, I understand your problem. No problem. I'm not, I'm not particularly pointing fingers at anybody. But if possible, maybe try to join a little bit early. That's why I open the flow by 522, 523 every day. Because that 7 to 8 minutes or say 10 to 15 minutes can give you that technical dilemma. 5, 522 onwards, the floor is open. It's okay if I open it at 530. I'm supposed to open the link at 530. But I do that every day, every single day from 522 or 23. Because I give you the technical space. Even I lost, I lose my uh, network at times. You saw it today. So it happens. So that's why we try to be 10 minutes early so that we can somewhat solve that. Anyway, let's move on. So I was trying to tell you that uh, when you come on the 20th, make sure you go back to some previous year question paper or your study material. See, again, people flocking in. Really cool. Okay, so go back to the study material or previous year question papers and uh, try attempting the annotation of the same. There are, there are no good annotations and bad annotations. Don't worry about going wrong. And I would prefer that you get it typed rather than written. It's okay, even if you write it and get it typed. Because Google Meet does not permit us to share photos. We can share screen, of course, but that's a difficult process. So if you have it typed, it would be better for us to discuss so that you can copy paste it in the chat box. And uh, I can quickly go through all your answers and help you in writing better annotations and essays. So I'm not asking you to write an essay in two days. That's totally fine if you don't do that. But please try to write at least one annotation I'm not giving you a particular question. Maybe you can take something as simple as to be or not to be. That is the question. Or you may attempt uh, three to four lines from some some work. That's totally up to you. And the Shilpa case, I think your cam is on. Please turn that off. Thank you. And all right. So on that note, let's continue with our discussions on angry young man of still people coming. Cool. So, yeah, uh, let's continue with the angry young man moment. Do not forget the assignment in two days. Please attempt an annotation. Typed, that is. Okay. So, speaking about angry young men, various British novelists and playwrights who emerged in the 1950s and uh, expressed scorn and disaffection with the established socio political order, order of their country are collectively regarded as angry young men. The impatience and resentment were especially aroused by what they perceived as the hypocrisy and mediocrity of the upper and middle classes. They were a new breed of intellectuals who were mostly of working class or lower middle class origins. Some had been educated at the post-war red brick universities at the state's expense, though a few were from Oxford. They shared an outspoken irreverence for the British class system, its traditional network of pedigreed families, and the elitist Oxford and Cambridge universities. They showed an equally uninhabited disdain for the drabness of the post-war welfare state, 
and their writings frequently expressed raw anger and frustration as the post war reforms failed to meet exalted aspirations for genuine change the strength was evident in john wayne's novel hurry on down in the year 1953 and lucky jim by kingsley amis 1954 and further evident in the play that you have been prescribed to study look back in anger in fact look back in anger became the representative work of the movement <sighs> all right so uh, that's a basic that, that basic that you need to know about the angry young men movement also that it simply meant resentment towards a post war ny if i can again give you a technical term yeah ny simply means situation scenario condition but then if you write post war ny it gives the evaluator an impression that you are aware of the technical term the post war ny okay so the post war ny is something uh, or the, the the solutions offered by the post war ny uh, created a sort of resentment and frustration among a group of authors and they express that uh, quite directly through their novels or their plays and uh, look back in anger could in that sense be called as one of the most defining works of that movement quickly moving on to the author that is uh, john osborne just a second oh did i no i have shared all them so i was just wondering if i missed out in providing all right just a second all right then so john osborne he was a dramatist actor screenplay writer theater manager knock knock who's at now shinil k saab okay fine yeah so and i've known him yeah john osborne john osborne was an actor playwright script writer theater manager and uh, he he was in that sense uh, a person who tried hands literally at everything in relation to theater and uh, i'm sorry um more people come okay just a second guys let me just let these people in yes satyendra kumar that's a technical term n u i e n n u i all right so he was a dramatist screenplay writer theater manager and uh, a sort of an anti establishment writer identified with the british left wing politics and uh, look back in anger is one of his most decisive plays and uh, the reason why it becomes significant is also because of the space in which it is just a second harita harita shajan harita harita shajan harita harita if you can hear me hello harita all right so sorry for that sorry for these interruptions because people keep coming in and uh, god knows why they come just in case they are keeping it silent all right okay so where were we we were speaking about john osborne all right
we must also okay all right sorry guys sorry for the delay okay so let's continue so he was a playwright he was a screen playwright a theater manager and so on and on and on he also had a working class background he left school early and joined a touring theater company and uh, he went on to work for several years in the company and he wrote his first play in the year 1950 look back in anger was his third play and it won him accolades it was a play that created a new sensation it received a lot of criticism as well and many attacked him saying that it is not promising but then it also became popular because it gave theatrical voice to the frustration and disillusionment of the young generation of the britons in 1950s just a second guys revati vijayan if you are here revati 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 vijayan revati all right so i was telling you that uh, he uh, the early it, it, the play contained the feelings or the resentment of people in the early 1950s and it was a crucial period because it was post the second world war and uh, the british society was coming to terms with the realities of the post world war era and uh, the most important thing is that britain lost its supremacy and uh, they were coming to terms with that even though they were victorious in the war against hitler the britain had to pay dearly for it after the war britain was faced with the reality of devastated towns and cities loss of large section of youth and especially the tremendous loss of resources and the eventual loss of world supremacy so this led to the loss of world supremacy and the the cold war politics was also another reality that they faced especially after the war and as you know the cold war happened between ussr on one side and usa on the other side dividing the world into uh, two there was also another threat of a nuclear war looming large which is still existent even today within the british society just a second all right so within the british society new trends were emerging at that time in the midst of new affluence the middle classes as well as people belonging to the lower sections of the society in britain were frustrated there was a kind of spiritual emptiness in the society and we find that there had been plenty of incursions into the power structure since early victorian times with the ruling classes resisting every inch of the way so it was a period of social confusion and a sense of loss another term that is often used 
in association with the writer John Osborne is the term angry young men as we discussed a little while ago they uh, the way in which these writers expressed the resentment and gave voice to the mood was quite specific and integral uh, to the time period and just in case i missed out on a few names uh, before you go back again to the study materials you may note down names like john brain b r a i n e alan silito s i l i t o e philip larkin kingsley amis uh, and so on people like john wayne to a certain extent works of harold pinter and very quickly i'd like to take you through a few more uh, technical terms like the well made play kitchen sink drama and a few more terms like that again these are detailed in your study materials but i am uh, bringing these technical terms before we get started with the story because i'm sure that will serve as a pointer to you all right so speaking about uh, those technical terms the well made play kitchen sink drama and so on uh, starting from the 1950s till the 1970s british theatre saw the rise of one of the most important movements named the kitchen sink drama so what is meant by a kitchen sink drama in kitchen sink theatre writers wanted to convey the language of commonplace discourse and to surprise with its straightforwardness osborne used one room flat in england a space where the sleeping area living area and the kitchen are the same room just a second So I was trying to tell you that. Okay, so uh, the writers wanted to convey. Really gonna lose my temper with these people. Right. Okay, so uh, in kitchen sink theater. writers wanted to convey the language of commonplace discourse and to surprise with its straightforwardness osborne used a one room flat in england a space where the sleeping area living area and the kitchen are the same room you can see a similar parallel built up in uh, look back in anger too so the room represents the lower working class social status of the characters in this play the kitchen is turned into a kind of public forum a space of debate and discussions dominated by male intruders the character jimmy and cliff and the relationship between sink and psyche is critical to this play as to many others of the time at one level it is a very clear class statement nida husi All right so at one end it is no that's okay it's not that i want them to respond these people revathi deepthi jinsi aryamol chandini nida hussein i really don't know what is the purpose of you joining 30 to 45 minutes late in a class what is it that you expect to hear in the middle and what do you expect to understand after coming 30 to 40 minutes late in a class and the sort of interruptions that you make is actually a break to my flow my consistency it is really difficult to withstand a black screen in front of you and try to teach theater to a group of say 50 to 80 people and to be very honest despite the classes being online the reason why i have had immense fun teaching your batch is somewhat close to 80 students have been consistent in class have been consistent every single day i have an audience of 80 it means there are people who are coming to my class on a regular note so there is continuity in what i say and they are also familiar with my style so it's really upsetting 
I'm sorry. So it's really upsetting it's when really people upset come, when say, 30, 40 can, minutes late. Please. Yes? Yeah, so it's really upsetting when, when you come 30, 40 minutes late. And what happens is uh, this thing beeps. And uh, every single time I'm trying to put forward something, in the middle of the statement, these beep, 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 beep. It's on record or else I'll, I'll really go on beeping. Those who have been in my offline classes would know that. It's really upsetting. Just think from a person's shoes. It's really, really, really uh, upsetting. Let me be frank about that. All right. I'm sure now even again there will be a few more people coming in at say 6.30, 6.47. I don't know what do you get from 7 o'clock onwards. If you want to get the essence of what I'm trying to say, be here at least from 5.40. I don't think that's too much to ask. 10 minutes into the class, come in. Or come after 6.30. If you've been attending from day one, you know that I do give you a two to three minute break for filling the sheets at 6.30. So join at 6.30. Okay, still fine. You at least get to know a patch, a particular section. I don't understand this 5.50, 6.6, Sorry that I'm being a bit angry today, but this is something I wanted to say over the last three days. Now see, I've lost it. I was trying to say something and I'm totally blank. Anyway, let's let, let's just take a small break, guys. What what I'll do is again, oh, this is something. Yes, Jennifer. You were talking about kitchen sink change. Yeah. Okay. Doesn't matter. I I I just come back to that a little bit later. I'm sorry for that. Uh, so again, uh, yesterday and today, I've received quite a few mails because yesterday I talked. Another guy comes. In. Cool. So, all right. The same story once again. Late two joiners, Shaila, Mu, and uh, Atli. You are slightly five minutes late. I was just uh, sharing my grief with others. I really don't get the point of you guys coming 50 minutes late. What do you expect to hear from me? Joining the class 45, 50 minutes late. It's really irritating for as far as my side is concerned. From tomorrow onwards, no matter what, after 15 minutes, I'm going to deny the entry. Shabila Yusuf, another person joining in. I don't understand what you mean by this 45, 15 minutes late entry. Please don't come to my class, say, 10, 15 minutes later. It's really upsetting. I can't speak. The moment I start speaking, in the middle of a sentence, the beep comes, admit, entry, exit. I'm going to deny entry to anybody who's going to come 10 minutes late to move. All right. So uh, I was telling that yesterday I was distinguishing between realism and naturalism. And uh, I received a lot of mails asking about the distinction between these isms. Uh, I thought I briefed it pretty well regarding realism and naturalism yesterday. And uh, on that note, there were also people who wrote to me about Dadaism, Surrealism, and Symbolism, which uh, I had referred to from the Crash Course Theatre site. So we'll take a small break so that I'd also be chill, hopefully, and I'll come back to you with a look back in Anglo story. And uh, it's not a futile break. I'm going to share with you this discussion on Dadaism and Surrealism and Symbolism. And uh, the moment it's over, I'll come back to you in peace and uh, hopefully share the summary with you. I mean, this plot of uh, Look Back in Anger with you. And it's quite a sort of a dramatic, uh, it's, a, it's quite a sort of ironic irony that uh, while teaching Look Back in Anger, you have to end up being angry. I apologize for that. Okay. So I share my screen with you. We'll, come, we'll get back in another 10 minutes and uh, continue with the play. Sorry. Hey there, I'm Mike Rugnetta. This is Crash Course Theater. And today's episode should be in the form of a manifesto because we've reached the 20th century. And pretty much every new movement comes with multiple mission statements at this point. But did those mission statements include animated sequences and one charming cranium co host? They did not. Today, we'll be exploring symbolism, surrealism, and Dadaism, the movement that argued how, in a random and senseless universe, the only approach is to be more random. Asteroid, several ducks in a giant teapot, cufflinks, roll title.
Writers like Ibsen, Strindberg, and Chekhov turned to symbolism later in life, although the movement's main proponent was the almost all symbolist, almost all the time, Belgian playwright Maurice Maeterlinck. Symbolism argues that poetry is superior to reality, and that out of the chaos and evanescence of human life, a quieter and lasting truth can be discerned. The movement got going in the 1860s and 1870s with folks like the famous poets Stéphane Mallarmé and Charles Baudelaire. It was formally announced in the 1886 manifesto published in the French paper Figaro. Here are some of symbolism's basic tenets. Truth in excess and extravagance. Truth in apparent chaos and insanity. Truth in subjective experience. Platitudes and natural banality are dangerous. We need to be constantly ever more audacious. The movement was anti-realism and resisted concentrating on the nitty-gritty of daily life. Instead, symbolists focused on poetic ideals and mysticism, investigating the profound mystery of human existence. The first symbolist theater was the Théâtre d'Art, founded by the 18-year-old Paul Faure in 1890. This move got him expelled from high school. A few years later, that theater became the Théâtre de la Ouvre, by the director Aurelien Lunye Po. He produced plays by Maeterlinck, Ibsen, and Strindberg. Where realism had accustomed theatergoers to a more lifelike style of acting, the Théâtre de la Ouvre was big on non-representational sets, and acting that looked like sleepwalking, and lines that weren't spoken so much as chanted. Butterlink wrote that he went to the theater hoping that the beauty, the grandeur, and the earnestness of my humble day-by-day -day existence would, for one instant, be revealed to me. That I would be shown that I know not what presence, power, or God that is ever with me. Honestly, seems like a big ask, but hey, small ambitions, small successes, am I right? Dadaism had less lofty goals, but man, it did have a giant impact on the arts and the world at large. The movement emerged in the cabarets of Zurich, Switzerland, at the tail end of World War I. The main idea was that if logic can lead to a global war, then art should abandon logic and reason in favor of nonsense, intuition, and anarchy. You want to get nuts? Let's get nuts. Tristan Sara, a former symbolist and the movement's main spokesperson, put it like this. The beginnings of Dada are not the beginnings of art but of disgust. Hugo Ball, Emmy Hemmings, and Richard Holsenbeck were early adherents, but in 1916, Sara created maybe the first Dada performance at the Cabaret Voltaire. This was a cavalcade of clowns and stilt walkers that featured Sara himself distributing balled up pieces of paper to onlookers while he sang a song. Oh, and no one agrees on what the word Dada means. Some Dadaists claim it was chosen from the dictionary at random. Dada was big on randomness, or what you can call the aleatory, the thing left up to chance. Zara's favorite mode of composition was to cut a bunch of words out of a newspaper, put them in a hat, and then pick them out at random to make a poem. Renaissance. Powerful. Artist. Probably. As he wrote in To Make a Dadaist Poem, the poem will resemble you, and there you are, an infinitely original author of charming sensibility, even though unappreciated by the ever heard. Dada made no distinctions between high and low art, mastery and amateurism, or sense and nonsense. At a typical Dada performance, a bunch of things would be happening all at once, a poem in a made-up language, a song, a dance, some very weird costumes, and it was up to you to make sense of it, or you could just jeer and leave. Upsetting the audience, especially the bourgeois audience, was part of the fun. Maybe even most of the fun. In the 1920s, the writer André Breton broke with Dadaism because he thought it was silly, and Breton wasn't wrong, per se. Breton started surrealism, borrowing the term from the playwright Guillaume Apollinaire, who called his 1903 drama The Breasts of Theresius un drame surréaliste, or a drama greater than realism. So that settles that. Very surreal. Surrealism looked back toward symbolism for a form that would unlock some greater truth of existence. The movement was influenced by the nascent theories of Freud and an emphasis on the unconscious, as well as the world of dreams. Realist theater sought a way to synthesize, as Breton wrote, life 
and death, the real and the imagined, past and future, the communicable and the incommunicable, high and low, so that these things ceased to be perceived as contradictions. There were a lot of surrealist factions, splits, and fights, but the basic idea was to merge the internal subjective world and external reality into one awesome super reality. Dada surrealism found logic drab and boring, where Dada favored the random, surrealism went big for automatism, an idea that the artist should just write or do whatever came into their head, sort of like stream of consciousness, but with even less control. First surrealist manifesto, Breton defined the movement as pure psychic automatism, by which one intends to express verbally, in writing, or by any other method, the real functioning of the mind. This, the Surrealists hope, would help the artist tap into something powerful, elemental, and something fundamentally, unflinchingly human. As Breton wrote in Surrealism's second manifesto, the idea of Surrealism aims quite simply at the total recovery of our psychic force by a means which is nothing other than the dizzying descent into ourselves, the perpetual excursion into the midst of forbidden territory. Even though the breasts of Tiresias precedes the movement, it's still probably the most famous realist play. Therese is tired of being a woman. When her breasts turn into balloons and float away, she becomes a man. And she makes her husband dress up as a woman. She sets off to conquer the world and campaign against childbirth, but her husband finds a way to have children, 40,000 of them, and he and Therese reconcile. For a closer look at these movements, let's explore an influential play that was written even before Apollinaire's. It has elements of symbolism, Dadaism, surrealism, and even naturalism, but somehow manages to be more vulgar than any manifesto would allow. Meet Alfred Jarry's ugly, violent, and sadistically funny Ubu Hua, which Jarry first drafted as a teenager. Initially staged as a puppet play, it was a merciless satire of Jarry's high school physics teacher, but also a parody of Macbeth. Jarry convinced Luni Po to stage it at the Théâtre de la Ouvre in 1896. The play is naturalist in its emphasis on degradation, almost like a rough play, but symbolist in its concentration on chaos and excess. It's also a forerunner of Dada and surrealism in its fascination with nonsense and nightmare. The actors are supposed to wear full body costumes that restrict their movements and acoustic masks that flatten their voices into a Translation has a hard time capturing just how crude and scatological this play is, but know that its first word is merde, which is a riff on the French word merde, meaning um, poop. And then everyone gets killed with a toilet brush. We've come a long way from neoclassicism and the unities, haven't we? Take us even further, Thought Bubble. Pa Ubu is a noble who is obsessed with food, money, and poop. He's a creature of pure id. Imagine Homer Simpson, but way less likable. His wife, Ma Ubu, convinces him to kill the king of Poland. He then holds a banquet and serves a poop-covered toilet brush, poisoning a bunch of people. But the Polish king's son, Bugrela, escapes, and his dad's ghost tells him to get revenge. Meanwhile, back at the palace, it turns out that a guy who came to the throne by murdering everyone in a really unsanitary way is not a good king. After holding an orgy to celebrate, he taxes the peasants and disembrains a lot of people, including all the nobles. He imprisons his sidekick, Captain Bordeu, who escapes and convinces the Russian Tsar to declare war against Ubu. Ubu places a cardboard cutout of a horse around his neck and goes to battle while Ma ransacks a crypt looking for cash. Ubu and the Tsar fight. Ubu loses and escapes to a cave in Lithuania, where he's attacked by a bear. Ma Ubu escapes and meets Pa at the cave. He throws the bear corpse at her, then beats her up. Bugala and his army arrive and beat both of them up, but the Ubus escape on a boat bound for Paris, where Ubu's pretty sure he can get a job as Minister of Finance. Thanks, Thought Bubble. I'm queasy for all sorts of reasons. On the first night, the audience heard the first word, poop, and they rioted, closing down the show for 15 minutes. Yates was there, and he later wrote, what more is possible after us, the savage god. The performance eventually continued, but the play closed that same night, and it wasn't revived again until after Jarry's early death from tuberculosis and excessive drinking, specifically a cocktail of absinthe, vinegar, and ink. Maybe the tale of the Ubus doesn't seem like a great play, 
but it's a pivotal work in modernism because of the conventions that it upends, and also because it's one of the first works of theater to take an openly hostile stance toward the audience, actively trying to cause offense. The play's whole argument, if you want to credit Ubu Wap with having an argument, is that greedy, grasping bourgeois life is dumb and ugly, and that's how it made its bourgeois audience look and feel. Weird as it seems, symbolism, surrealism, and Dadaism were all profoundly interested in realism and the ways that realism fails to convey the truth of human existence. The symbolists, surrealists, and Dadaists argued that the truth isn't found in everyday conversation or rigorously researched domestic interiors and costumes, but in dreams, visions, imaginings, the stuff buried deep in the psyche, the innermost recesses of the human brain and in the immensity of the universe that it perceives and creates. And also sometimes in a hacked up newspaper article thrown into a hat. Next time, we're gonna look at expressionism, a movement that tries to convey the subjective, distorting experience of emotion and mood. All right, hopefully peace be restored and uh... Here I am back again, and uh, well, uh, those videos in Crash Course Theatre is not only pertaining to Theatre of England, but also to pertaining to global theatre. So you may also, it's your responsibility to go back and uh, search for the phenomena and uh, how and when they occur or appear in uh, English theatre. Surrealism, for instance, one of the masterpieces of surrealist plays is The Blood Wedding by Federico Garcia Lorca. Just in case you want spelling, Blood Wedding by Federico Garcia Lorca. He was also a popular poet, by the way. So you may go back and uh, read the summary of the play. In, uh, and uh, when you say surrealism, surrealism simply means, in simple terms, portraying the opposite of what is stereotypical. For example, the image of a mother is that of peace, purity, innocence, and so on. In Blood Wedding, we see mother as a blood-sucking vampire. Or generally, moon is considered to be a romantic imagery. But in Blood Wedding, you see that Moon functions as a sort of uh, uh, torchlight to people who are in search of to runaway lovers. So go back and have a look at that. Also Expressionism, which is another video. Uh, you don't have to study an Expressionist play in British theatre. But when you learn, say, for example, an American playwright like Eugene O'Neill, then you may have to be familiar with Expressionism as well. So you may go back and... Uh, make your research in those areas. I'm sharing the attendance marking link. Uh, you may do that side by side because it's already 636. So I'm going back to look back in anchor. You may do your little research on kitchen sink. I shall come back to that sometime later if we get time. For the time being, because of want of time, I'd stick to the particulars pertaining to look back in anger, the play. And uh, the theatrical part of that. All right. Basic plot and uh, what it means to us regarding look back and anger. So the play, if you see, follows a young husband and wife, Alison and Jimmy Porter, as they attempt to know, navigate class conflict and deal with a deteriorating marriage in 1950s England. So the couple, they are addressed as Porters, P-O-R-T-E-R-S. And please don't get confused with the coolies who carry weight. So that's not the case. The family name is Porters. So Jimmy and Alison Porter, they are a couple trying to cope up with the class conflict as well as uh, the, uh, say, a sort of a, a problematic marital bond. And... Uh, Alison comes from a traditional upper class background, whereas Jimmy is from a working class background, though, though he's highly educated. And the couple lives with Cliff Lewis, an affable working class man, and Jimmy's longtime friend. The scene opens on a Sunday morning in the apartment 
uh, and as the scene opens, we can see that Allison irons clothes while Cliff and Jimmy read a newspaper. And this ironing imagery uh, is central in terms of certain discussions. People refer back to it as uh, domestic subjugations from a feminist vantage point of view and so on and on. That it's again up to you to uh, make references as you feel like. Um, also, uh, a point that you need to note is, uh, like I told you yesterday, apart from, I mean, as, as the plays evolved from the Shakespearean era, the five act plays had slowly started to uh, decrease or to shrink. So look back in anger, for instance, is a three act play. So in the first act, when the play opens, Alison irons clothes while Cliff and Jimmy read a newspaper. And when you when you come to those uh, plays of say the twentieth century, another great thing that I have noticed is that uh, there is a lot of stage description going on in the script. If you look at dramatic literature, that's if you look at a literature, uh, if you look at the script of the play as a text, as you are supposed to, uh, then you can see that uh, the stage directions are abounded or in, or quite a lot in these plays. For example, if you look at Look Back in Anger, uh, you can see that in Act 1 itself, there are two pages spent by John Osborne in detailing the stagecraft. I'd just like to read it for you before we continue with the story, because that's also significant in understanding and appreciating the play. And uh, just in case this would help you a bit more, you can read along with me. Um, all right, I'm sharing my screen with you. The book you can find in BOK. It's not a prized possession that I only enjoy. All right, so this is, a, this is act one of the play. There are three acts, if you can see the contents page. The time is the present, so act one has an early evening in April. Then you have two weeks later, the following evening, then several months later and a few months, few months later. That's quite a quite an interesting time division in the play. Okay, so in act one, you can see this detailed two page description before it all starts. The porters, one room flat in a large Midland town, early evening, April. The scene is a fairly large attic room at the top of a large Victorian house. The ceiling slopes down quite sharply from left to right. Down right are two small low windows. In front of these is a dark oak dressing table. Most of the furniture is simple and rather old. Upright is a double bed running the length of most of the back wall, the rest of which is taken up with a shelf of books. Down right below the bed is a heavy chest of drawers covered with books, neckties, and odds and ends, including a large tattered toy teddy bear and soft woolly squirrel. So look at also the difference with, between Allison's high class and uh, Jimmy's uh, predicament. So up left is a door. Below this is a small wardrobe. Most of the wall left is taken up with a high oblong window. I'll tell you what an oblong window is. This, look out, uh, this looks out on the landing, but light comes through it from a skylit beyond. Below the wardrobe is a gas stove, and beside this, a wooden foot cupboard on which is a small portable radio. Down C, okay, I forgot what C is. All right, down C is a sturdy uh, dining table and three chairs, and uh, below this, left and right, two deep, shabby leather armchairs and when the curtain raises jimmy and cliff are seated in the two armchairs right and left and as we said they are reading the newspaper so all that we can see uh, of either of them is two pairs of legs sprawled way out beyond the newspapers which hide the rest of them from sight they are both reading beside them and between them is a jungle of newspapers and weeklies when we do eventually see them, we find that Jimmy is a tall, thin young man, about 25, wearing a very worn tweed jacket and flannels. Again, shows about his class hierarchy. Clouds of smoke fill the room from the pipe he's smoking. 
he is a disconcerting mixture of sincerity and uh, cheerful malice of tenderness and uh, free booting cruelty restless importunate full of pride a combination which alienates the sensitive and insensitive alike blistering honesty or apparent honesty like his makes few friends to many he may seem sensitive to the point of vulgarity to others he is simply a loud mouth remember that these these descriptions do not go to the stage the initial descriptions goes on stage arrangement but this is for the understanding of the reader this has to be conveyed when the play is enacted uh, a little while later so yeah so this goes on to uh, the depiction of the character later and uh, the uh, playwright has simply put it for your understanding and uh, if jimmy alienates love cliff seems to exact it demonstrations of it at least even from the cautious and then he goes on to interpret a uh, cliff as a foil to jimmy and uh, standing left below the foot cupboard is alison she is leaning over an ironing board beside her is a pile of clothes so that's where the patriarchal interpretation comes in hers is the most elusive personality to catch in the uneasy polyphony of these three people she is turned in a different key a key of well bred malice that is often drowned in robust orchestration of the other two hanging over the grubby but expensive skirt she is wearing a cherry red shirt of jimmy's but she manages somehow to look quite elegant in it she is roughly the same age as the men somehow they combine combined physical oddity makes her beauty more striking than it really is she is tall slim dark maybe when you enact it it could be the other way around she is fat possible the bones of her face are long and delicate there is a surprising reservation about her eyes which are so large and deep they should make equivocation impossible the room is still smoke filled the only sound is the occasional thud of alison's iron on the board it is one of those chilly spring evenings all cloud and shadows and presently jimmy throws his paper down and that's how the play begins the reason why i read the stra- stage directions is because uh you have to be aware of how they have crept in to say the 20th century plays unlike say for example if you look at shakespearean plays there are detailing at times for example exit polonius but then there is no this much of a detailing uh, taking place so that's a distinct feature that emerged later so in order to do that i was just trying to show this to you and i would also like to show a somewhat replica of what i showed you or what i read to you right now and uh, this is from the play one of the adaptations of the play uh, i shall share the link with you later but as of now i'm sharing the screen with you and if you see this is not a complete uh, exact of what is being said in that script but you can see that uh, there is somewhat a replica of what is being portrayed in that script i'll share the link with you later all right so let's continue with the plot uh in the meanwhile please make sure that in between you get to fill the attendance sheet as well uh i'm sorry that i'm not giving you more time uh freely to fill those sheets those who joined late you may also comfort your selves by doing that all right so in the opening scene we can see that alison is ironing the clothes while cliff and jimmy are reading a newspaper and the first act largely consists of jimmy's angry tra- angry tirades against upper class complacency and his wife's lack of enthusiasm jimmy thinks that suffering is the only way to experience true human emotion and that alison and the other upper class people are therefore less alive than he is well this is a stereotype that even you may be familiar with we come across this plot even in several movies where a hard working guy may say i was born into a poor family 
and it is because i was presented with challenges that i have reached so far and you guys you rich guys know nothing about this and uh, it is because i was born poor and i worked hard that uh, i could experience all this that's a popular stereotypical narrative so the first act uh, is basically about uh, these uh, conceptions that jimmy porter in particular carries he thinks that suffering is the only way to experience true human emotion and the people like alison are therefore less exposed to it because they are into a good background in terms of class he also seems to have some nostalgia for a past age in britain when the country had more power again that's typical of the angry young men plays or angry young men works so looking back at the nostalgia uh, reminiscing it with some sort of a reverence i still have people coming in and in and in anishwara shirin well i don't want to go for that again okay so yeah he looks back at the past britain with reference with admir- with reverence with admiration and as i told you uh this reverence is something that's also because britain lost its supremacy to the bipolar world post the second world war so that can be seen in jimmy porter too and uh, his attempts to shock his wife into some display of ima- emotion escalate as the act progresses he ends up insulting her family and complains that all women are out to destroy men cliff in an attempt to cheer him up begins to banter and uh, uh, try to console him the two the two fall against alison's ironing board and she burns her arm jimmy apologizes but she yells at him to leave and he exits quite common place if you are in a chauvinistic space uh, you may come across similar situations so in this case right from the beginning we are seeing alison ironing and then jimmy starts insulting her family because of his uh, introversion maybe or because of the complexes that he has but nonetheless he abuses them then cliff tries to pacify him and eventually they fall over the ironing board and uh, he's asked to lead leave by uh an angry alison uh cliff hel- cliff helps alison treat the burn and uh, she reveals to him that she is pregnant with jimmy's child so that's where the revelation comes so uh because of the sort of cold war between jimmy and uh, alison she is yet not been able to disclose it to her husband so when jimmy leaves Uh, after this incident uh, she reveals it to cliff who is still there uh, as she tries to treat her burns and uh, she hasn't told this to him to, to, to jimmy because she is afraid that he'll feel trapped and angry so again look at the understanding level of the pair the couple jimmy is quite abusive and uh, accusatory and kind of discontented with his life often compares with the uh, class of alison and uh, he feels belittled himself so considering that he would be further upset alison has concealed this truth and mind you in that she has a better understanding and the practical applications towards jimmy so she does not uh, conceal this because uh, she feels that jimmy will feel trapped and hence he'll become angry cliff comforts alison and tells her that jimmy loves her a stupid thing to say especially after such a you know warm round of abuse and uh, cliff kisses her and jimmy enters while they are kissing but doesn't acknowledge or object and uh, uh, at that time the three live in a non traditional setup uh, in itself is something that would have been sh- shocking to the audience at that time so to add to it cliff is Uh, kissing Alison, and uh, Jimmy enters, but he does not protest or acknowledge the same. Soon after, Cliff leaves to get some cigarettes, and Alison and Jimmy share a tender moment. They play their bear and squirrel game. Again, you can go back to your study materials and uh, uh, de- read a bit more on this bear and the squirrel symbolism in the play. Uh, that's a childlike game that they play. So the bear and the squirrel game. which allows them to escape into affection while pretending to be animals 
Then Cliff returns and says that Helena Charles, one of Allison's upper class friends, is on the phone. Jimmy's mood immediately darkens. When Allison says that Helena wants to stay with them, Jimmy explodes. Just a second. Somebody's mic is unmute. All right. So when he's when he say when she says that Helena wants to sh uh, stay with them, uh, Jimmy explodes. He says he wishes that Allison would have a baby that would die so that she could experience true suffering. And this is a point of dramatic irony in the play, because we, the audience, by now know that Allison was already pregnant. But Jimmy, out of a sheer ignorance and out of anger, which is a typical characteristic that he has throughout the play, yells out at Allison and says that she should have a she should have a baby, and she should have a miscarriage so she, so that she could appreciate uh, you know the uh, experience, or she should have a, uh, an experience of true suffering. Uh, which is his base, ac base acquisition. He says that he's the only one who's underwent all sort of problems and uh, Alison lacks such deeper sufferings. In this point, the first act comes to an end. And the second act begins with Helena and Alison sharing the womanly duties of the home while Jimmy plays his trumpet off stage. Alison tells Helena about her first months with Jimmy. They lived with his working class friend, Hugh Tanner and spent time going on raids of parties of Allison's upper class friends. She says that she felt like a hostage from those sections of society they had declared war on. Helena asks her a logical question, why they got married. And Allison says that it seemed to be largely because Allison's mother and her father disapproved. It's quite an interesting statement, isn't it? Because our parents disapprove at that you know, heat of youth, we tend to elope and get married. So that made Jimmy want to marry her no matter what. Jimmy and Cliff, meanwhile, come in to eat. When he hears that Helena and Allison are going to church together later that day, Jimmy also becomes convinced that Helena is out to take Allison away from him. He lets fly a series of outrageous insults against Allison's mother. Helena tries and fails to reason with him. And Jimmy asks whether she has ever watched someone die. He tells the story of watching his father die from wounds receiving from fighting in the Spanish Civil War when he was 10 years old and claims that this taught him more about life than Helena and Alison know even now. So we can see a lot of parallels that uh, Jimmy draws in order to prove that he has experience towards deep realities of life. But the problem is also because in order to do so, he belittles others unjustifiably to such extents that they feel insulted. Uh, now, near the end of that scene, Jimmy leaves to get the telephone. While he's gone, Helena tells Allison that she has sent a message to her father asking him to come pick Allison up. Allison does not protest, probably because she is done with this, uh, this uh, activities of Jimmy. So she does not say, oh no, you shouldn't have called my father. When Jimmy returns, he, he says that Hugh's mom the working class woman who sets him up in a candy stall and for whom he harbors deep affection is dying of a stroke. He asks Alison to come to the hospital with him. Instead, she goes to church and Jimmy is left alone on stage. So again, a sort of foreshadowing taking place. In the next scene, we see that her father packs Alison to leave. He reveals that he thinks he and Allison's mother reacted too strongly to her marriage with Jimmy and that Jimmy might have been right to be angry with them. He says he thinks that Jimmy could be right that he is a relic of an old version of England 
let us cease to exist. He also says that he and Alison have a tendency to stay neutral and not to take a strong stand on things. She is surprised to hear this from him. And as she finishes packing, she briefly reconsiders her move. And then Helena enters and Alison decides to go. She says goodbye to Cliff. Helena stays behind because she has a work meeting the following day. Alison and, the, and her father exit and Cliff, angry that Helena has disrupted their life, leaves before Jimmy comes back. Jimmy returns a few moments later, furious, having seen Alison leaving with her father on his way home. Helena gives him a letter that Alison wrote explaining her decision. Jimmy is angry at her polite, restrained language. Helena tells him that Alison is going to have a baby. He says that he is not overcome with emotion at this news and insult Helena who slaps him. So again, we must see that uh, Jimmy is quite the same. Even when he gets to know that he is about to become a father, he does not bring much of an emotional transformation. Instead, he continues to insult. Instead of Alison, he insults Helena and he slaps him. And yeah, in return, gets slapped. I'm sorry. This causes Jimmy to collapse in despair. And then, if all these twists were not enough, Helena kisses him passionately and the act ends. Of course, you come across plenty of such non-commonsensical scenes in most of the movies and novels. You take the case of the first modern novel, Pamela, where a maid is being abused by her master. A master threatens to molest her, to question her modesty. But in the end, she consents to him and uh, marries him and has a set life. So similarly, uh, when Jimmy insults Helena, she slaps him and as he collapses, she pulls him back and uh, involves in a wide, long range of smooching, just as you see in Hollywood, Bollywood movies. Yeah, rom-coms perhaps. So the next scene opens several months later, looking very similar to the beginning of Act 1, except that it is now Helena who is ironing. I'm sure you need no uh, superpower to, to, to understand what it means. So Alison has left and as the new scene opens, we see that Helena is ironing. Jimmy and Cliff joke and discuss newspaper articles. Cliff, in the meanwhile, while they play together, dirties a shirt. Helena leaves to clean it and while she is off stage, Cliff tells Jimmy that he's moving out. Jimmy wonders why he always chooses women over male friendship, even though he values Cliff's company more highly than he values Helena's, or for that sake, even Alison's. Helena comes back with a shirt and Cliff leaves to dry it in his room. Helena tells Jimmy that she loves him and he asks desperately to never leave him. Then Alison appears at the door looking sick and disheveled. The next scene opens a few minutes later with, Jim, with Jimmy playing his trumpet off stage, where Alison tells Helena that she's not angry with her and is not trying to break up the new couple. Helena, however, says that Alison's presence has reminded her that what she is doing is wrong. Alison has also had a miscarriage and Helena considers this a judgment on her relationship. And uh, just in case you have slightly missed the story somewhere, let me remind you that a few scenes back, that scene ended with uh, a dramatic irony statement made by Jimmy that you have to have a miscarriage if you have to have a true understanding of ground realities. So here, Alison has had a miscarriage and uh, Helena considers this a judgment on her relationship. She calls Jimmy back and tells him that she's leaving. Jimmy says that he always knew Helena wasn't strong enough for true love, which requires muscle and guts. Helena leaves, nevertheless, without listening to Jimmy. Alison 
apologizes and Jimmy says that she should have sent flowers to Hugh's mum and remember his first meeting with her when he thought that she had a wonderful relaxation of spirit. This turned out to be just complacency, according to him. Alison lets out a cry and tells him that the loss of their child has made her understand the depth of emotion that he wanted her to have all this time. She tells him that she wants to be corrupt and futile and collapse at his feet. Jimmy can't bear to see her this way and kneels to help her. Then, with a kind of mocking, tender irony, he launches into the bear and squirrel imaginary game. Poor squirrels, he says to Alison, and she responds, poor, poor bears. And that is somewhat a gist of that play. We still have so many people coming in. And for those who are asking for the attendance link, well, darlings, you have it in your chat box. Okay. So that is somewhat the gist of the plot. Now, speaking about the play, the sort of questions that you may come across is justify the title, look back in anger. Or how far does the title uh, justify the angry young men, young men movement? Sometimes you may be asked to write a character sketch of Jimmy Porter. These are the three regular recurring questions that comes forth. And if you ask me, is this a is this a text worth considering? I would say that not exactly. If you have five better options, like say for example, Foster's Hamlet, Midsummer Night's Dream, and uh, maybe something like Murder in the Cathedral and Waiting for Godot, I think you can easily uh, look beyond this work. But if you want to, the reason why I'm saying that is in most of the works that I've pointed so far, you have plenty of aspects to discuss. An essay may not really be a summary, but as far as a look back in anger is concerned, all that you can end up doing is probably uh, writing the summary, which, which is possible. And uh, sometimes that may cost you marks. You may end up getting 10 or 12 out of 20 because all that you have done is you have written the summary. It's a possibility. So that's something that you need to mind uh, when you write uh, answers from or questions from uh, this play. So let's briefly discuss those themes. As I told you, uh, the title or the aspects of angry young men or the character sketch of Jimmy Porter. In fact, all three can be uh, put into one. As I had told you several times already today, uh, what happens with uh, uh, Jimmy's character throughout the play is that he is an epitome of angry young men. He's a representational type of angry young men. Right from the moment the play begins, he is frustrated. He's discontented with the class structure, which has led him to struggle. And when I say struggle, he is not completely into a lower middle class scenario. He is perhaps in a in a developing state, and uh, that is also because of his education. Back then, in that society, even in today's society, education is a passport to a better uh, social climbing. So Jimmy Porter, unlike many others, would be happy with the fact that you have learned, uh, you have you are well learned, and uh, you can climb up the social ladder. Jimmy Porter is quite frustrated with the social setup. He has frustration towards everything that he comes across to such an extent that we see that the women in his lives are treated uh, miserably by Jim. We often wonder that the treatment is so inhumane, not only in terms of the domestic roles that these women do, just like the ironing imagery shown in two acts but also with the amount of abuse that these women undergo. We see that uh, Jimmy abuses Alison throughout 
not only her but he also abuses her entire family for no wrong of theirs the same is continued with helena even though she at one point slaps him we see that that slap is not a feminist slap or anything it's just a mere uh, spontaneous response but ever since that we can see that helena also gets into that stereotypical domesticated role and uh, in the play we have to see that throughout the play as i told you jimmy ang sorry jimmy porter uh, remains to be an angry young man he is discontented he has complaints he is totally frustrated with the life that he is in and he believes that uh, people like alison or the people from the upper class would never appreciate or understand the problems faced by uh, jimmy and the middle class people because they have not faced the real problems of life jimmy goes on to give a lot of instances including the troubles that he has encountered face to face they may sound flimsy or commonplace but nonetheless he raises them to his support and he claims that uh, At, at at a very climactic or crucial point of the story he claims that alison should get alison should get pregnant and uh, she should have a miscarriage so that she could appreciate uh, the sufferings better and uh, in modern terms you would say that it's such a cruel thing to say uh, to your wife uh, any 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 uh, ideal husband would not spit out such statements to your wife but here because of the complexities that he is uh, full with uh he ends up saying that uh, uh you should have a miscarriage and only then you would understand this so we can also feel that he is quite thoughtless he simply speaks out what's in his heart or what's in his mind than uh, reflecting on it reflection never happens with jim he simply spits out random and because he does that uh, you could see that some thing is beyond common sense or beyond comprehension or beyond logic because when he says alison should have a miscarriage who is alison after all or who is uh, uh, what does this miscarriage mean to jimmy on a general plane because the miscarriage is jimmy's own child when alison has a miscarriage what is lost is jimmy's baby but again that is also accounted by a much more understanding alison who says to cliff at one point of time that she hasn't told us that is about pregnancy to jimmy because she knows that jimmy would feel disturbed because again he has to have a burden in his head and he would end up accusing her of not taking care of uh, you know the preventive measures so uh, we can see such dynamics throughout the play so the play is highly representational of the angry young men movement a dissatisfied hero the class hierarchy a single room shared by three people yeah a single flat apartment setting with uh, three people sharing the room and uh, there are still debates as to the relationship between these people and there are people who say that um cliff uh, alison and jimmy had a sort of a um, polygamous relationship among themselves there are also studies which claim that cliff and jimmy shared a homosexual relationship and uh, then there are people who doubt eyebrows regarding the relationship between jim alison and helena even though triangular love stories are quite common uh, in most of the films and novels that we may come across so but at the same time the the thing to be noted there is that uh, Alison and to a certain extent Helena are committed to Jimmy but Jimmy is more passive he does not really give it back to them and he believes that women is trouble and the misogynistic viewpoint stands out throughout the play but i believe that the feminist elements may not be asked for your exam but nonetheless uh, the misogynist uh, aspects of Jimmy Porter is pretty evident throughout the play and if you look at the title of the play look back in anger it is further justified again due to this cause of anger by uh, jim he is angry like a red hot iron right from the beginning of the play and even when the play ends uh, he is somewhat the same in fact he is it, it it doesn't happen that uh, a character remains flat in uh, a play especially if he is a protagonist again introducing to you two critical terms 
just in case you are not familiar with it. Yep. Flat and round characters. You may need them, especially while you discuss uh, Shakespearean plays and also when you discuss novels. What do you mean by flat and round characters? Round characters are those characters who undergo a rapid transformation from the point of beginning. Whereas flat characters, they remain the same throughout the play. Whether it's a novel, play or movie, whatever it is. To give you a simple commonplace example, uh, take the case of most of the you know, 1980s, 1990s movies of Mohanlal. Mohanlal's character may have a starting point and he will come to a transformation by the time the movie ends. He won't be the same guy when the, novel st uh, when the movie started. But then uh, when it comes to, uh, say, the roles played by Jagadi, Jagadish, or the, uh, the other guy, uh, Shangaradi, would be of sidekick. These days, Suraj Vanyara Moodle, yeah, or Paresh Ravel, for instance. They play the foil. And no matter how many times they get beaten, no matter whatever happens to them, they remain the same throughout the play. That's called flat character. A typical example comes from the play uh, Henry by William Shakespeare. In the play, I think Henry the First and Henry, it's in two parts, Henry the First, uh, sorry, Henry Fifth, part one and part two. So in that play, in part one, we come across Prince and his friend Falstaff, F-A-L-S-T-A-F-F, who, uh, who are in a merry-making venture. But by the time part one ends, king dies and the prince becomes the next king. He assumes as Henry V. So what happens? The king undergoes a transformation or the prince who turned as a king undergoes a transformation. He becomes uh, a changed man. He becomes a serious man. Whereas Falstaff continues to be in the uh, live the moment life. He boozes, he adores women, he makes out, he makes fun of them. He does all the sort of mischief. And this also leads to a conflict between the king and his friend. So uh, Falstaff is often considered as a typical example of a flat character. <coughs> so generally flat characters are those who play sidekicks, not the protagonist. But here, if you look at the character of Jimmy Porter in Look Back in Anger, we can see that he is sort of a flat character. Right from the beginning of the play to the end of the play, he does not undergo any change. His prejudice is not shaken. He is in a way machoist or he is in a way a sort of a, um, what do you call a, a, a patriarchal or, or a male dominant chauvinist person. And to, even at the end of the play, there is no change. It seems like a silly ending. And that's why the play was initially, uh, the play received mixed responses. It was, it was not that popular initially because of that. It gained popular, it gained currency because of the spirit of angry young men in the play. But then there are a lot of scenes which we would disagree with, especially the ending is something that's not convincing enough. Alison comes back, Helen leaves, and uh, Alison speaks about uh, or tells Jimmy that she had a realization because she had a miscarriage and she breaks down and then... <coughs> Jimmy feels sorry for her and he tries to play prank, the squirrel game, and they reconcile. So it seems quite nonsensical to our commonsensical thoughts. But nonetheless, that's the ending that the play takes. And uh, uh, you may also, at this point of time, there's one thing I missed out because I was not in a chronological way today. I was in a mixed bag with this people coming in and coming, going out. And uh, I was a little bit frustrated initially. So I missed out a, a slight um, introduction to John Osborne initially. Uh, he has written quite a few plays uh, and a novel titled, uh, of course, he's also um, you know, adapted the novel of Oscar Wilde called Picture of a Dorian Gray into stage. Uh, and most of his uh, plays have also become movies, including Look Back in Anger. So um, he was quite popular 
for his works apart from look back in anger as well but then this is considered as his masterpiece so for example his major plays include hedda gabler uh, gift of friendship under plain cover west of suez s u e s u e z uh, very like a whale the right prospectus time present and the hotel in amsterdam a bond honored a patriot for me in i'm sorry in admissible evidence luther and so on and on and on and he went on to write the film script of tom jones mind you the the novel of henry fielding it was made into a film and it was john osborn who scripted or who wrote the screenplay of the film the eponymous name unchanged to and another masterpiece of his is place calling itself rome and uh, another work being sense of detachment so you may go back google it and uh, have an idea of his writing style just in case you intend to write this for your exams it's an optional thing as i told you this play is not that significant when compared to other plays this is good in terms of the angry young man element but uh, you would end up writing the summary there is nothing much for you to write if you relish in writing good answers uh, if you study certain points and if you are able to bring out a well drawn out argument then that is found lacking or wanting in this play but nevertheless you can go back to the play if you want to as usual i'm sharing the links with you in the chat box the link of the play i won't say that these are all perfect ones it is more of an adaptation so give it that sort of a, a space uh, i'm also sharing the link of a stupid lecture i call stupid because it's quite indianized so maybe you may not like it as much but just in case you have patience to listen to it a lecture on um, look back in anger um, i think i had saved the movie link too maybe i had misplaced it somewhere oh my god i'll look for that and get back to you later let's not waste our time or should i is a second look back in at the an hour and 50 oh yeah yeah no that's a play an hour and 54 minutes long well i'm not sure i missed the link somewhere it seems well doesn't matter i'll get it to you just in case i am able to figure out that link again or else you may depend on your study material whatever is available to you all right so on that note let me conclude the session for today we have 10 minutes for q and a the floor is open but before i open the floor let me remind you a couple of things for those who joined late and for those who didn't hear from the beginning first thing is i'll be dealing with waiting for godo to go and unlike yesterday the day before and today i won't be really going on lecturing on waiting for godo i'll be rather taking a hamletian stance to move because waiting for godo is such an interesting play uh, there is no point in summarizing the play because the play does not really have a plot it can be ended with a subtitle nothing happens nobody comes nobody goes so within that inactivity what is the activity that stage craft and acting so i'll try to do that tomorrow so have an excite i am optimistic about having an exciting day tomorrow and uh, yeah and uh, after the day after, i mean on the day after which is 20th which is our last class i'll be discussing with you how to write ideal annotations and uh, essays and uh, in doing that it would be good if you come prepared with at least one annotation it can be as simple as to be or not to be that is the question or you may take 3 to 4 lines from the previous year question paper and try answering that ideally i'll be happy if you get it typed so that you can copy paste it in the chat box i can have a look at it and tell you where you went wrong and what are the areas you can improve and don't worry i'm not going to take names and say um uh, jennifer you went wrong here or uh, sri devi you have to focus on this or uh, 
whatever. I'm not going to be specific about the mistakes that you do. I'd give you a general overview of where you go wrong, and I'd also tell you how to write good annotations and uh, good essays. That's what we'll focus on the 20th. So, if possible, try uh, writing an essay. Sorry, an annotation before you come on the 20th. And uh, the second thing is, uh, please, please, please don't log in after 10 to 15 minutes of the start time because it's really irritating as far as the presenter is concerned. And uh, um, I, I don't think that helps because I try to get into sort of a discussion and then this thing keeps pinging on, ping, 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 ping. And it's really upsetting. And uh, I've tried to be courteous. I've tried to be good and gentle and uh, kept mum over the last few weeks. But then it was really, really taking a toll today on me. Even yesterday and the day before, I was really, really upset with the sort of incoming beeps. <clears throat> but in the end, I end up being a humanist. And I think that no matter how late they are coming to my class because they want to improve uh, their career and life. So I try to be benevolent. But don't expect that benevolence every day. Don't test people's patience. I'm benevolent to you because I know most of you are trying to, trying to hold on to your lives amidst the pandemic. And most of you are, uh, say... Uh, after five, six, seven years later, you have sprung back to studies and uh, you're married, you have a life, you are meeting two ends. And in between that, you're also trying to learn. So I try to be as benevolent as I can to you. So I apologize for being angry as well. I, anger is not an attribute that I have. If you ask any of my students, they tell you that they know me as a benevolent human being. And uh, I, I really don't like letting out my anger to anybody. Even at extremely testing situations, I try to be calm. But somehow, I lost my cool today because it was really, really demanding. Every second I tried to ignore that and move on, this beep, 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 beep kept clinging on to my ears. And uh, the problem is, I could simply hit a deny button. But the problem is, again, they'll try to enter and this beep keeps hitting. So the only option I have is let them enter and uh, send them out of the room. But that's not a good gesture, I suppose. I can let them enter and uh, remove them from the meeting. Uh, removing from the meeting in Google Meet means they cannot come back to the same link again, at least not on that day. But I don't want to be that cruel. If I let them in, then why remove them? But if you come at 6 o'clock, 6, 5, 6, 10, blah, 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 boo, 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 then it's quite upsetting as far as a person is concerned. And as I told you, I, I really love this art. I told you that I work as a regular faculty, an assistant professor in a college here in Cochin. And the college is ranked number one in India by NAAC, NAC, National Accreditation Council. And uh, I work there from Monday to Saturday. And despite that, if I work in IGNU, that's not because uh, I have some lucrative benefits of IGNU being a, a university. Even if somebody gives me a lack of crows, that's not going to help us in any manner. As teachers, let me trust you, there may be people who would be uh, carried away by the perks that you get from the profession. But trust me, there is something called true passion. If you, if you relish in literature, what excites you is the way you transform it to someone else. It's like a marathon. Whenever I speak about my teachers in the early classes, when I spoke about Dr. Madhukar Rao, Dr. V.C. Harris, or uh, Dr. Rengarajan, or anybody for that sake, uh, Professor Shari Jacob, they all talk to us about this marathon. They have, Dr. K. Aipapanikar, for instance, Aipapanikar Mash used to say this every time. You know, I'll die someday, but I'm sharing my light with you. You have to carry this torch and hand it over to the future generations. You have to ignite the spirit of literature in the upcoming generation. Because literature is a dying art in the contemporary socio-political scenario of our nation. So I try to do that the best. And as you know, during COVID times, even I am handicapped. I keep, I'm not bluffing to you. You can go back to any of my former students in RC Coach in Kerala and ask them how my offline classes are. I gave you a glimpse during Hamlet. I'm not somebody who is happy with this black box and sitting in front of it and simply speaking to God knows who's listening to me and not. But despite that, I've never compromised on the quality or the material. I've tried to listen to you. Even though it is humanly impossible to cater to the annotation question demand, because most of you were asking this frequently every day in the chat box, and I could understand your desperations. I could think from your shoes, the desperate nature that you have. But go back and remember, look back at my last two classes. I was discussing murder in the cathedral, and I was discussing some passages. 
that's why it also went to our past so i have tried to fit into your shoes and all i'm asking for you or from you is some understanding and i don't think it's too much to ask for i can understand if there is a genuine reason somebody is stuck with some domestic work maybe there is if, if, if it was a period of holy week for instance there is people who are going to pray and they have come back you have to make tea for them so you could join only by 6 6:15 i can at least understand that but otherwise i don't get this point at all and blaming the network does not help because if you try to join from 5 5 10 then you would easily be able to join by 5 20 25 a network issue that is if you try to join from 5 40 normally it becomes 6 o'clock it's natural and the problem that i have is that i have a cluster of beeps one beep two beep fine i let them in that too when i'm trying to speak the same happens when somebody unmutes it is an interruption while i try to speak and generally i'm not someone who likes to suppress anybody's voice if you if you look at that every last 10 minutes i really relish those 10 minutes because i believe that's the most fundamental democratic time in my class your voices are heard and we engage in discussion which i believe is the pillar of any de- any democratic state and it is not that i want you i want to silence any of you i'd love to hear from you no matter how you perceive that a lot of people write to me uh, write mails to me saying sir i'm sto- i'm sorry if i'm stupid but i would like to know if my point is right and this is my question you need not feel apologetic at all because it is when you make mistakes that you get to know that you were wrong and you could correct from there and i don't blame anybody in my classes generally this is one exemption because i really couldn't take it i was really trying to you know match this timing it's a huge headache one and a half hours for a play or two hours for a play i really mean it go back to any university look at their module division in the syllabus it's given three or two to three plays in a module and they give 18 hours let us six hours per play we don't get that even when i say i wind up my class on 28th there are at least two or three plays which i haven't touched even though i can so comfortingly say that an academic counselor is not supposed to teach so you can't blame me you are distant learners you can learn yourself but i really want you to learn benefit from my classes and i want really want you to appreciate theater theater is such a rejuvenating space if you practice theater even if you try acting monologues you would see that the problems in your life would slightly start to you I mean you would look at it from different perspectives there would be more peace in your life it's like dance there are a lot of women who practice dancing it's not only about staying fit physically it's also about the emotional purification the same happens with theater so despite this barrier of an online setting i try to bring forth a lot of elements to make sure that you have at least a basic understanding of what theater is and how it functions nonetheless here comes another saint i don't know what to say about that okay our time is up guys uh, um, but still we can spend 5 minutes if you have any queries and uh, <laughs> okay that's a constructive way of looking at it shaila priya but i'm really sorry for being angry at you i i really didn't intend to it's just that i just lost my senses for a while though i would justify it on logical grounds i always appreciate me being at some cool sense so sorry for that yeah the floor is open if you have any queries we can take that sir can i ask yes please sir? please go on what was the reaction of women to the play well i have no direct uh, reference to what was the reaction of women to the play maybe i think you have to go back and have a look at uh, some critical essays if available i'm not sure i have no idea but then again i'd like to say one more thing to you i have been sharing a lot of resources with you and uh, one such resource is bok and uh, uh, just in case you have still not familiarized how to use bok i show you one more thing one more magic that's present in bok okay yeah this is the home page of bok 
and you may type any keywords for instance i'm typing tom dons okay. and you type the name of a text whatever it is you would get a set of books and especially studies based on that in pdf format i'm sure you're familiar with this by now but at the same time in the second part you would see a column titled articles yep so if you click articles you will come across quite a few pdfs which the thing as significant to that work and maybe better than a book you might be interested in these research articles okay irony in tom jones for instance could be a question so if you read that pdf you will have certain points with you while you go for your exam okay so you may go to this and have a look at it just in case you want to so this is another window that i wanted you to be familiar with all right anything else sir shall we apply for the exam now uh i did tell you these technical things you have to contact the office contact prema ma'am and uh, ask her about these things i think the window has been opened and it's there till the 15th of june i'm not sure you may contact the office people they'll be able to guide you better okay thank you yes sir anything else all right so in that case we'll call it a day guys hopefully we'll come back all refreshed tomorrow and it's my humble request please make sure that you don't join say 10 minutes late once you join even if you have a technical issue and if you go out you can come back i, I won't be uh, asked to admit you again so that's not a problem you log in at 525 then that's fine thank you sir yeah and jiji mol jiji mol there is no need to excuse try writing annotation as you have an understanding let it be wrong no problem i am not here to tell you that you are wrong or your writing is not good that's not my intention i'm here to help you and the day after i'll try to help you so try your hand take a simple line try explaining that and let's see how it goes yeah so something is better than nothing so don't uh, stay idle if you attempt then that in itself would become an inspiration for you to try more so don't think that others would do it for you and they would do it better try it your try your version as well and hopefully you will get a better version okay so thank you guys good night peace see you see you tomorrow thank, thank you sir thank you sir tomorrow we'll be dealing with samuel beckett waiting for godo